Mr. Chairman, can I have your permission to display some slides during my speech? Yes, please. Minister Gan has highlighted efforts to ensure health care remains accessible, affordable and of good quality. I will now elaborate on how we are developing capabilities and capacity for the future, ensuring that Singaporeans have access to good care close to their homes. The cornerstone of a sustainable health care system is a strong primary care, where patients with chronic conditions are managed well in the community with better health outcomes. In addition to our newly opened polyclinics in Pongo and Pioneer, there are ongoing polyclinic developments in Yunos, Kalang, Sembawang and Bukit Panjang scheduled to be opened by 2020. Minister has announced plans to develop a further six to eight new polyclinics, which will enlarge our network to 30 to 32 polyclinics by 2030. I'm pleased to inform members that two of the new polyclinics are expected to be operational by 2023 and will be developed in the northern region, Nisun Central, and eastern region, Tampines North. Residents in the west and central regions can also look forward to new polyclinics. We are also renewing our existing facilities, redeveloped Bedok and Amokyo polyclinics opened in July 2017 and January 2018 respectively. The redeveloped Isun polyclinic will open in mid-2018. Dr. Chia Shi Lu has asked for updates on our primary care transformation efforts. We are investing more resources to support our GP partners through the primary care networks or PCN scheme. PCNs are networks of GPs delivering care via multidisciplinary teams comprising of doctors, nurses, and primary care coordinators who will provide holistic care. The PCN scheme commenced in January this year with 10 PCNs on board involving more than 300 GP clinics. We hope to eventually see 50% of Charles GP clinics on board the scheme. I've shared MOH's vision for primary care, which is one Singaporean, one family doctor in previous UOS debates. The PCN scheme complements our efforts to encourage trusting long-term relationships between doctors and their patients. Let me elaborate. Madam Siti Saujana, a diabetic patient has seen Dr. Kwong Kam Hung for the past six years. This continuous follow-up has allowed Dr. Kwong to gain a deeper understanding of her needs. For example, Madam City's high blood pressure was detected early as Dr. Kwong had advised her to screen for other chronic conditions as part of the plan in managing her diabetes. Madam City has also benefited from the team-based care offered by the NUHS PCN, which Dr. Kwong's clinic is a part of. She received advice on her diet and lifestyle activities from the PCN nurse, as well as utilised diabetic eye and food screening services provided by the PCN team. The PCN care coordinator also ensured her appointments were well coordinated. I'm heartened by the strong rapport and trust forged between Madam City, Dr Kwong and the PCN care team, and encourage all Singaporeans to have a regular family doctor today. We are also, in, to open our primary care sector, we are also increasing capacity across various settings to ensure appropriate and seamless care. Since 2010, we have opened or expanded five hospital facilities, namely Ng Fong General Hospital, CGH St Andrews Community Hospital Integrated Building, Jurong Community Hospital, Yishun Community Hospital, and Kutik Puat General Hospital. The development of three more hospitals are underway. Sengkang General and Community Hospitals will open by the second half of 2018, while Outram Community Hospital will open progressively by 2020. Hospital bed capacity will increase further when the Integrated Care Hub at Novena and the Woodlands General and Community Hospitals open by 2022. In addition, the National Centre for Infectious Diseases will progressively open from end 2018. Aged care capacity will be increased to meet the demands of an aging population. By 2020, home care capacity will increase from the current 8,000 places to 10,000 places, while daycare capacity will increase from the current 5,000 to 6,200 places. There are also plans to increase the number of nursing home beds from the current 14,900 to 17,000 beds. In tandem with the increase in infrastructure capacity, is the need to ensure sufficient manpower. 
Mr. Christopher de Souza asked if we are calibrating the training pipeline for specialists to meet medium to long term needs. We have increased the proportion of residency positions offered to specialties that are in greater need to address the demands of an aging population. The number of residency positions taken up in advanced internal medicine, rehabilitation medicine, and geriatric medicine have doubled from 4% of the total residency intake in 2013 to 8% in 2017. MOH does regular review to calibrate the number of residency positions for each specialty based on our projected needs. MOH also periodically reviews the training requirements to ensure relevance to our local context. This includes instituting a mandatory geriatric medicine modular training program to equip residents with the skills to manage elderly patients. However, we cannot indefinitely increase capacity and manpower. We have thus embarked on efforts to improve our care delivery. Mr. Chen Sao Mao and Mr. Bei Yam King have asked for updates on the war on diabetes. This is a whole of nation effort where everyone has a role to play. MOH is developing a patient empowerment for self-care framework to empower people with diabetes to initiate and sustain lifestyle changes with the support of healthcare professionals, community-based providers, and other forms of social support. Under this framework, there will be a national curriculum developed with educational materials for patients, caregivers, and the public, and resources which healthcare professionals and community-based providers can use for patient empowerment. The first tranche of the materials will be available by mid-2018. MOH is currently enhancing our diabetes management programs. As part of the Diabetes Management Work Group set up under the National Diabetes Prevention and Care Task Force, we have rolled out initiatives targeted at eye and kidney complications. We will now address diabetic foot complications, as diabetes is the most common cause of non-traumatic lower extremity amputations, or LEAs. In 2015, about 180 diabetes-related major LEAs were performed for every 100,000 adult Singaporeans with diabetes, compared to OECD average of 60. MOH will be setting up a work group to review the National Organization of Diabetic Food Services, make recommendations on national care guidelines, and review the roles and training needs of healthcare professionals involved in diabetic food care to, degree, to, to decrease the lifetime risk of amputation for diabetic patients. Mr. Speaker, let me now speak in Mandarin. Tenyaoping,如果不尽早治疗,或管理不善,将有可能导致多种长期并发症,如失明,肾衰竭和下肢截肢。在二零一五年,每十万名新加坡成年,甜尿病患者当中,就有将近一百名遭受下肢截肢
will launch the patient activation to community empowerment engagement for diabetes management, which is PACE D program in the West, where patients will be assigned to dedicated multidisciplinary care teams who will support them to take on proactive roles in disease management and lifestyle changes. Even as we develop new initiatives, we need to ensure the delivery of safe and quality care. Ms. Silverlim has asked about how hospital complaints on patient care are handled. Hospitals have their own Hospital Quality Service Patient Relations Office to deal with such complaints, and patients' inputs are sought as part of the review process. Mediation is another avenue for patients and their families to resolve their disputes with hospitals. Complaints escalated by patients to MOH are taken seriously and assessed in an independent manner for potential breach of the Private Hospitals and Medical Clinics Act. A formal investigation will be initiated by the Regulatory Compliance and Enforcement Division against the hospital once a potential breach is identified. The independent investigation by MOH will include opinion from the relevant appointed experts and interviewing of all parties related to the case, including the patients and their next of kin. Under the PHMCA, institutions are required to report occurrences of serious reportable events to MOH and establish quality assurance committees to review these serious reportable events. Investigation reports are submitted to the Clinical Quality Performance and Technology Division under the Healthcare Performance Group of MOH. The priorities of this division include quality assurance, patient safety systems, and quality improvement. One of the division's focus is to leverage on the reported serious events for improvement and cross-institution learning opportunities, similar to the approach of the United Kingdom's Healthcare Safety Investigation Branch. Anonymized information is shared amongst the healthcare institutions, and forums are organized for healthcare institutions to discuss guest uh, gap closure measures. To future-proof our healthcare system, it is important that our law stays current and flexible. As announced earlier, MOH is enacting a new healthcare services bill to replace the current PHMCA this year. The bill will adopt a modular services-based licensing system to allow providers more flexibility in holding licenses for any combination of healthcare services provided. It will also appropriately regulate non-premise-based services, particularly as you want to encourage the outreach of community healthcare services, such as home medical services. Regulatory clarity will be enhanced to make it easier for providers to understand and therefore comply with the legislative requirements. New requirements and competency mandates will also be introduced, including an additional governance layer called the Clinical Governance Officer, to provide technical oversight over more complex services, such as clinical laboratories and radiological services. Fundamentally, the new bill will allow MOH to strengthen its legislative powers to achieve our primary regulatory objective, which is safeguarding patient safety and welfare, as well as continuity of care. Such powers include prescribing a list of prohibited unsafe practices that providers cannot offer, as well as mandatory participation of all healthcare services providers in the National Electronic Healthcare Record, or NEHR. I will elaborate more shortly. We have actively consulted stakeholders on the proposed policies in the new bill, and I'm heartened by the generally positive feedback received. Licensees appreciated the flexibility of the licensing approach to accommodate various care models. The public was also supportive of the enhanced powers in the bill to have step-in rights, tighter publicity controls, and prohibition of unsafe practices. Specifically on the mandatory contribution of summary clinical data to the NEHR, licensees and members of public were generally supportive and provided feedback on aspects such as the cost of digitization, opt-out procedures, and patient confidentiality issues. Dr. Lily Neo has asked about patients who may prefer to opt out of NEHR. I would like to reassure her that patients can choose to have their records locked 
we should prevent it from being viewed and assessed. We are also studying a proposal where patients' future records will not be stored in any HR at all. However, patients should note that this will cause a permanent gap in their medical record history. To support licensees in this journey, MOH and the Integrated Health Information System, or IHIS, have introduced financial, technical and clinical support to help licensees. For example, $200, $200 million under the Early Contribution Incentive Scheme is available to help licensees defray the cost of upgrading the IT systems to contribute data to the NEHR by June 2019. Even with the introduction of the new bill, current regulations may not be flexible enough for the emergence of innovative care models. To address this, MOH will be rolling out the License Experimentation and Adaptation Program, or LEAP, which is a regulatory sandbox that will allow new services to be piloted in a controlled environment. During the pilot, MOH will ensure that these businesses maintain essential safeguards for patient safety while relaxing certain regulatory requirements or introducing new ones. Thereafter, successful pilots will be mainstreamed under the Healthcare Services Bill with appropriate regulatory requirements. For a start, the sandbox will focus on piloting models in three areas, namely telemedicine, precision medicine, and models of care that support aging. More details will be announced in the coming months. Mr. Lo Tia Kiang has asked about how precision medicine can be harnessed for patients' benefit. Worldwide, we have seen how precision medicine treatments can be costly without strong evidence for improved health outcomes. Our end objective must be to support the development of precision medicine for positive health and economic outcomes. To this end, MOH is coordinating a multi-agency effort to develop an integrated national strategy for precision medicine research and its subsequent implementation. This includes looking at enabling infrastructure, regulatory and ethical frameworks, as well as public education. We will provide a thorough update and an appropriate time. MOH also ensures that human biomedical research is carried out ethically. Gene editing is presently used in basic research in Singapore and is governed by the Human Biomedical Research Act and guidelines issued by the Bioethics Advisory Committee and National Medical Ethics Committee. Mr. Lowe has also asked about the standards for the provision of clinical genetic testing. MOH conducted stakeholder consultation uh, last September. The feedback provided will be taken into consideration when ref refining the standards, which are targeted to be rolled out in the second quarter of 2018. The sector will be given a sufficient ramp up period before the standards become legally enforceable. Part of developing a future-ready outlook is the task of preparing for anticipated healthcare challenges. Overuse of antimicrobials such as antibiotics in the human, animal and agricultural sectors has exacerbated the problem of infection causing microorganisms developing drug resistance. Antimicro -resist antimicrobial resistance or AMR is an international issue as drug-resistant microorganisms in other countries can easily spread across borders to Singapore. MOH, AVA, NEA and PUB had jointly developed Singapore's National Strategic Action Plan on AMR, which was launched in November last year to chart out how agencies will work together to detect and arrest AMR to increase surveillance, education, management, research and international cooperation. As a member of ASEAN, Singapore will continue to promote cooperation and innovative collaboration to strengthen ASEAN's resilience against AMR. Besides AMR control, vaccination is important to prevent infection and reduce the risk of infectious diseases outbreaks. Mr. Leon Pereira has asked about MOH approach towards subsidizing vaccinations. To ensure collective population level protection or herd immunity and encourage vaccine uptake, childhood vaccinations against highly infectious diseases with community outbreak potential, such as measles, are fully subsidized at the polyclinics. For diseases with low community outbreak potential, for example, 
HPV-related diseases, vaccination is recommended for personal protection. The National Adult Immunization Schedule was introduced on the 1st of November 2017 to provide guidance on the recommended vaccinations that persons 18 years and older should receive, and MediSafe use is allowed for these recommended vaccinations. Mr. Chairman, my ministry will continue to build capabilities and increase capacity in the future to ensure that we have a future-ready healthcare system. This task cannot be achieved alone. I urge all Singaporeans and healthcare providers to partner us in this initiative to make our healthcare system better and keep Singaporeans healthier. Thank you.